Before I start, I want to acknowledge um, and celebrate the first Australians on whose land, uh, traditional lands we meet, uh, the Ngunnawal people here on campus, and pay our respects to the elders past and present. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sudato Subio di Puro, uh, Pak Ato, uh, Director General for ASEAN Cooperation in the Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and the Principal Coordinator of Indonesia's role as Chair of ASEAN in 2023. Uh, Pak Ato was previously Ambassador of Indonesia to India and Bhutan, uh, and before that Deputy Chief of Mission uh, in the Embassy of Indonesia in Washington, D.C. Uh, and before then, uh, Apex Senior Official, uh, where I first met Pak Ato, uh, Apex Senior Official for Indonesia, when Indonesia hosted uh, Apex in 2013. It's a real tremendous uh, pleasure to introduce Pakato and to have him here uh, and for him to make time for us on his, his busy trip to Australia to share his thinking um, and right on the heels of President Jokowi's visit um, to Australia. Um, this is a big year for Indonesia and Fazian. After a successful G20 summit and G20 year, uh, at a time really where no other country uh, could have managed given the geopolitics. I don't think that's an exaggeration to say. Um, now Indonesia is chair of ASEAN. Uh, of course, as by far the largest economy uh, and population in ASEAN, uh, the 10 member uh, Southeast Asian grouping, um, Indonesia's leadership matters. It matters to ASEAN, it matters in the broader region. The last time Indonesia chaired uh, ASEAN, uh, 2011, they gave us RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership idea, uh, and they shepherded that through to conclusion, and now it's in force. So we're looking forward to seeing the outcomes of this year's ASEAN Summit, uh, and to note that Indonesia, of course, is already a global player of significance, and we should have high expectations for Indonesia this year. I'm personally honoured to be hosting this at the ANU, uh, having first met Pakato back then in 2013 and again in Delhi when you were ambassador. Uh, because uh, there are few strategic thinkers of Pakato's capacity in, in the region uh, and to have him uh, steering this uh, grouping, uh, ASEAN, through a difficult time, um, we're really lucky to have his thoughts, uh, to have him share his thinking with us uh, tonight. Uh, so with that, um, Pakato will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we have, in fact, a lot of time for Q&A and discussion. So uh, please join me in welcoming Pakato. Thank you. That's an intimidating introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Shiro. Thank you for that uh, very uh, generous um, introduction. Um, I have to uh, correct that uh, I wasn't the APEC song, but I was the alternate senior official. Um, and let me um, give a disclaimer. Uh, I do come from the uh, bureaucracy of the government of Indonesia. So I will be speaking at that level. Uh, if you hear some bureaucratic jargons, uh, please understand that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> Uh, but I welcome this uh, opportunity to be uh, not only to be talking, but also to um, be exchanging views uh, with all of you. I welcome this opportunity. Uh, it's uh, it's an academic setting. I've always believed in the importance of uh, you know looking uh, uh, at the horizon and beyond uh, to be uh, thinking more freely. So it's it's in that context uh, that uh, I will be uh, I will be uh, talking. Um, the theme that uh, I'd like to uh, touch on is on ASEAN centrality, uh, why it matters, um, and uh, for that uh, I'll uh, jump uh, straight into it. Uh, uh, but before I do that. Let me uh, thank Peter Dreisler in particular and, and Shiro for arranging all of this. Um, we've had previous discussions uh, on this and uh, uh, I really appreciate this. It's not only an opportunity, but I, I see it as a, as a privilege to be here. All right, so on ASEAN centrality, uh, why it matters, I'd like to uh, 
perhaps touch on three things. I'll speak briefly and then we can uh, afterwards have a discussion. Uh, but first, I'd like to uh, touch on uh, a bit of history and then uh, about what is centrality as I look at it and uh, why the why question, why, why does it matter? Um, so turning first on history, um, all of you would know it was uh, founded uh, more than 50 years ago, um, part of Southeast Asia. Uh, it was founded uh, partly as a response to uh, a geopolitical uh, context. It was, um, continues to be geographically a fractured region, but it was also fractured uh, politically, uh, economically uh, back then. Um, and it uh, developed over time, the, the evolution of it uh, from our perspective, uh, Indonesia's perspective uh, at this point in time, um, is that there were a few um, benchmarks for our, for Indonesia's, uh, every time we host uh, a summit. The first was in 1976, when we had the uh, first ASEAN summit in Bali. It produced the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. It was a response to the geopolitical situation, uh, the United States withdrawal from, from Vietnam, and um, uh, some geo geograph geo geopolitical upheavals uh, in the region. So this was a response. It created um, the ASEAN Secretariat. It agreed on the establishment of uh, uh, economic cooperation. Um, and it also talked about the need to establish um, the uh, uh, nuclear weapons free zone. The next Indonesian uh, hosting of the summit was in 2003. Uh, this was the Bali summit. Uh, what it produced was an agreement on establishing an ASEAN community. So the background to it was that uh, with, the, with the joining of uh, CLMB um, into ASEAN in the late 90s, there was this big, big debate uh, in the early 2000s uh, within ASEAN whether ASEAN was going to strengthen its external engagements um, or whether it should strengthen its internal um, um, uh, internal mechanisms. So the answer was to establish a, a mechanism. And with it came also agreement to establish an ASEAN charter. Um, and uh, note that this was a period, <coughs> this was a period of the uh, all of this happened during a, a Cold War, post-Cold War period. So it was a period of norms building, institution building, um, a period of uh, hopes, hope, uh, a period of peace dividends. Uh, various institutions were established, ARF in 94, uh, EAS in 2000 and 2004, uh, ADMM and, and others. And then next was, uh, the third time was uh, in 2011, where RCEP was um, was established, agreement to establish it, uh, as Jairo uh, mentioned also um, uh, earlier, uh, to develop RCEP. And now, uh, Indonesia's chairmanship is again taking uh, taking place at the uh, uh, regional upheavals. Uh, a lot of dynamics in the geopolitical side, the geoeconomic side. Um, and this, this question about uh, the ASEAN uh, centrality um, always comes up. So when we talk about centrality, um, this gets into my second point, we are actually talking about uh, four, three or four interlocking concepts. Uh, the first is, uh, is geographic centrality. Southeast Asia lies at the um, very strategic uh, geography. It's a maritime crossroad. Um, the 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 uh, the interest. <coughs> excuse me. The um, the the security and prosperity of many countries depend on. The 
must be the cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> the security and prosperity of many countries depend on access to and access through the region. So it becomes a, it beca it is a contested, uh, uh, let me repeat, uh, it is a region from which countries project, but ASEAN is not, the ASEAN region is not necessarily a contested region because of the existence of, of ASEAN itself. Uh, so that's the, ge the geographical side of centrality. Um, it is also a, a fractured region, as I touched earlier, but if ASEAN uh, remains as an entity, uh, then it is not necessarily uh, one that is fractured, but it, it can become um, a community, but a community uh, that has to be managed. And it is also a maritime uh, region. So when we start to think about the geopolitical context, it is in that context. It is about a, a maritime uh, region. Um, so when we talk about this geopolitical concepts like Quad, AUKUS, uh, it is very heavily uh, maritime in nature and uh, the response of ASEAN would also has, has to be corresponding. ASEAN is a maritime region, uh, it has developed thinking over, the, over uh, 20 years uh, along these lines. Uh, there's the ASEAN Maritime Forum established uh, more than 10 years ago and recently ASEAN agreed on an ASEAN Maritime Outlook. Uh, basically to bring together uh, various branches of cooperation within, within ASEAN into, into one uh, document. It is a challenge for ASEAN just to develop its own uh, rules and norms for a maritime region. Um, I don't think uh, for now we have uh, really developed uh, those rules and norms. There are rules and norms developed uh, in instruments such as the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Um, we, we've had the Zone of Peace, Freedom and, and Neutrality Doctrine for uh, more than 50 years. Um, the uh, Treaty of Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone uh, has that heavy maritime uh, component to it. But uh, when it comes to rules and norms uh, for this maritime region, uh, this is something that uh, ASEAN needs to, to develop. Um, and secondly, it's, uh, in terms of centrality, it's the uh, institutional and diplomatic centrality. Um, and what, what I mean by this is that uh, it is between, uh, within ASEAN and ASEAN-led mechanisms that countries come together uh, to discuss various issues relating to the region. So. Um, Australia, of course, has been a partner for um, basically 50 years now, one of the most long-standing partners, uh, supporter uh, of ASEAN. Uh, Japan also 50 years, um, but other countries have come together also to, to uh, be part of this uh, regional architecture. So last, uh, last week for the series of foreign ministers meeting, there were um, uh, more than 200 uh, kinds of meetings, uh, including important bilateral meetings, uh, the foreign ministers of uh, US and China, China, Australia, uh, China, India, um, and others. There were meetings, uh, trilateral meetings. Uh, I know that Indonesia had meetings with uh, Russia, China, and then a trilateral meeting with uh, Australia and India. So various kinds of diplomatic engagements uh, took place at the sidelines. Of, of the ASEAN meetings. And then in September at the summit level, uh, I would imagine uh, many important bilateral meetings will also take place. People are wondering whether President Biden and President Xi Jinping would, 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 or the Chinese Premier would meet or not. Um, yeah, we'll see. Um, and then also uh, within the ASEAN mechanisms, there are 51 um, um, countries that sign on to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Uh, there is the um, we, ASEAN has 11 dialogue partners, six sectoral dialogue partners, and four development partners. You can ask me later what 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 they mean. 
um, and I have colleagues that will explain, <laughs> help me explain what they are. Um, and then uh, there is a, a strengthening uh, diplomatic process, the Jakarta process. Uh, there are ASEAN ambassadors uh, in Jakarta, and then dialogue partners also have ambassadors in Jakarta. So Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, Korea, uh, US, Canada, um, India, uh, UK, EU, um, Russia. Um, I think Norway also has an ambassador to ASEAN. So this creates a, a diplomatic community and a Jakarta process that I think is, is strengthening. And uh, we, we are looking to further strengthen it. Um, and we, we put it uh, upon us in ASEAN, how to strengthen ASEAN's own uh, internal mechanisms. So we, we are developing uh, the diplomatic centrality, uh, but it's also um, the ASEAN foreign ministers last year asked this question among them. Uh, does ASEAN have the wherewithal to deal with, uh, with rapidly changing uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic context? Um, I guess their, their answer was their answer was no because they, they agreed that this should be further discussed. So now uh, there's discussions about the decision making process, about uh, strengthening the diplomatic process uh, uh, existing at the ambassador's level, about strengthening the uh, ASEAN Secretariat, uh, perhaps the role of the Secretary General. Um, and also strengthening, strengthening as other ASEAN debt mechanisms. Um, at the ASEAN Regional Forum meeting last Friday, um, ministers talked about um, how ARF can shift discussion from confidence building measures into preventive diplomacy. Uh, what would be needed? This is a question that ASEAN uh, as partners have, have been struggling for uh, the past uh, almost 30 years. Um, but the region does uh, require a response. We'll see whether uh, the ARF can come up uh, with uh, such a response. So IUTS, uh, on my discussions uh, in Canberra today uh, and tomorrow, I think also touch on, on these issues. Um, and finally, um, economic uh, centrality. So um, ASEAN has become, uh, it is an economic community or an economic community in the making. Um, it has consistently had about a fifth or a fourth of trading internally within ASEAN. And it, is, it has been the largest trading partner for China for at least a number of years. Um, and it is the second largest trading partner for, um, let me see. For Australia, India, Japan, South Korea. It is the fifth largest trading partner for, for the US and the sixth uh, largest trading partner for, for the EU. So, from a macro perspective, it is um, becoming more central for the economic interest of, of many countries. And finally, um, you know, let's talk about uh, why it matters. So, um, First, for ASEAN itself, centrality also matters for its own unity uh, because it's a fractured region. So as long as it can remain central, it will help in ASEAN's own uh, uh, community building, its own unity. Uh, without centrality, ASEAN also runs the risk uh, because it is built on a, on a fractured region. So it needs uh, that centrality, efforts to maintain centrality, uh, to 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 strengthen its unity. So it's, uh, it's two sides of the same coin. Uh, so this is something that uh, when ASEAN, you know, one of the things in ASEAN is it wants to, uh, uh, there is a drive for a common identity. This is the Asia that is, uh, that is non-Chinese, non-Indian. Uh, it wants its own identity. Um, it is also a region that wants to avoid the experiences of the Cold War, uh, the trauma, if you will. Um, so there's uh, there's that drive. Um, uh, secondly, uh, um, there is there is a need for ASEAN to ensure its diplomatic uh, uh, centrality. 
to set their rules and norms. Um, and it also provides a useful option for, for the major powers. Um, if we see a region that is um, in the midst of an arms race for each country to pursue its security, then it is a question of whether countries see their security increase uh, with increasing uh, defense budgets, or there needs to be an alternative to it. So ASEAN will provide that inclusive platform to uh, develop rules and norms that can help countries uh, to, to uh, gain security, uh, but also not at the higher level of armaments or deterrence. Uh, because deterrence and incidents is only one step away. So it's a, ma it's a matter of providing an alternative uh, to the regional geopolitical uh, context. Um, and then ASEAN also, a centrality would mean uh, it is a, a able to expand its circle of friends. Um, and what I mean by this is that, uh, for example, at the coming East Asia Summit, uh, the leaders will also invite the leaders of the um, the chair of the Pacific Islands Forum and the chair of the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So expanding uh, the circle of friends and expanding uh, uh, rules and norms for, for cooperation and for interstate uh, relations. So um, let me uh, stop uh, with those points. I think anyway I've uh, spoken long enough. Um, and I look forward to um, uh, our discussion on, on this issue. Thank you very much. A nice reminder of the track record of Indonesia in chairing ASEAN uh, and all the big initiatives from TAC to the ASEAN community to ASEP. Um, and I want to come back to what you have planned for this year um, in a second. Uh, but I think, you know, going back to thinking about 2003 and the debate about strengthening internal mechanisms versus external mechanisms. But clearly that's now um, seen very complementary and, and you pursue both on the same, uh, at the same time. Um, and it, it reminds me, you mentioned uh, intra-ASEAN trade, trade within ASEAN, it's often cited to be low at 25%. But I think that's a sign of success because ASEAN trades with the rest of the world a lot, very open and it's outward oriented. So I think that's a strength. But that also means that ASEAN is more susceptible to a breakdown in the international system, to a fracture in the confidence we have in, in open multilateral trade, uh, a lot more to lose. So uh, you mentioned strengthening norms and rules um, in how ASEAN deals with external partners um, to get away from this zero-sum world. I guess in that context, um, can you give us a bit of a preview of the thinking of what your um, what Indonesia is doing this year as chair of ASEAN? What economic initiatives or what uh, initiatives to help engage external partners uh, to keep this region, this part of the world open, uh, to main, make sure that ASEAN uh, remains open, prosperous, stable? And then, and then we'll come to uh, other questions in the audience. So the first, um, I think the most obvious would be uh, to solidify RCEP and that is um, establishing an RCEP secretariat uh, to be co-located within the ASEAN secretariat. So different entities, um, same whole, um, it will have its own uh, rules and regulations. Uh, so that, that would be uh, the first. We are making progress uh, in that in terms of um, uh, funding for it. So we'll see um, uh, when this will uh, be established. And then learning from the experience, recent experience of the, uh, of the pandemic, um, of the situation, uh, the war in Europe, in Ukraine, um, and other challenges, it's to prepare the region for future shocks. Um, and this would uh, be thinking about uh, ensuring uh, the resilience of its, of its uh, uh, supply, production and supply of food, energy, um, also the uh, health architecture and financial stability. 
Um, and then as to the uh, the next uh, economic agenda, it will turn into uh, the um, uh, digital agenda. Um, an ASEAN um, digital community, if you will. Um, um, and then uh, uh, developing the digital economy framework agreement um, in which uh, I hopefully this year can start uh, negotiations of it. And because there's a, a relatively young population that is uh, highly tuned with the digital world, uh, it will be something, it, it will be uh, a growing, uh, already from a significant base uh, at the moment, but it will also be a driver for growth. And then of course the trade and investment agenda. And finally, uh, on uh, ASEAN uh, Indo-Pacific Outlook. So um, this is uh, um, uh, a geopolitical, geoeconomic uh, concept um, that has basically two components for it. Um, one of which is the uh, is on the more concrete side, is um, on concrete cooperation, um, how to uh, build, invest, in the connectivity and infrastructure side um, in ASEAN. There will be a big event in September at the sidelines of the ASEAN summit, but it's a question of uh, how to uh, making this sustain uh, into uh, uh, other years. So how would partners then invest in the uh, connectivity and infrastructure side of the region? Um, and then the, uh, the more strategic side is how to um, you know, the uh, ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific calls for ASEAN to lead in the shaping of the strategic and economic architecture. So how to uh, uh, further build on this? Operationalizing that, we'll all be watching very closely. Um, John, first, here in the middle. Uh, 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 thank you. Please just wait for the microphone. Here, so <coughs> uh, anyone else who'd like to start signaling to me? Thank you, Dalakasi. Uh, John Waxon from here in the Bell School. Um, we know that, uh, and, and you touched on this in your remarks, that uh, ASEAN has been a facilitator of remarkable transformation of a war zone, poverty stricken war zone, to a prosperous, stable, uh, you know, central instrument and central region, uh, what John would call the maritime fulcrum, if you like, uh, of the Indo Pacific. And really, a transformation. But we witness today a tearing away of the fabric of ASEAN in what's happening in Myanmar, uh, and it is uh, it appears to be gravely uh, toxic for the ability of ASEAN to achieve its objectives. In the past, Alialta, Gareth Evans were instrumental in a breakthrough in the rehabilitation of Cambodia. Um, Australia and Indonesia, when we work together, can really do amazing things. Um, and I know Redna Masudi's played a very prominent role in pushing for ASEAN and others to play a constructive role in Myanmar. Uh, but I'm wondering why you're here in Canberra. Is this part of your agenda? Is there hope for uh, Indonesia and Australia to make a difference, to rehabilitate Myanmar in the next foreseeable future? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. Well, we have in our midst uh, Ambassador Gary, uh, Gary Wright, who was instrumental in uh, Brunei's chairmanship here. Um, we'll uh, ask him this question later. We'll not put him on the spot now. Um, the challenge for ASEAN is uh, really uh, how to move forward with its community uh, building efforts uh, without being, uh, without being taken hostage by the Myanmar situation. And this my minister uh, made very clear at the outset of our championship year. Um, it is a reminder that ASEAN is not only about Myanmar. Um, so that's why uh, we put aside uh, our own resources to handle this. Uh, the office of the special envoy is being uh, managed by managed and led by Ambassador Muraswa Yaya. So he's uh, the one under uh, the minister uh, really working behind the scenes, uh, various meetings, various engagements. Um, also my uh, minister, Minister Masudi, um, uh, behind the scenes. 
It is part of the ASEAN uh, family, uh, but also there is a lot broader, uh, much broader ASEAN agenda uh, beyond Myanmar. Um, and uh, I talked earlier about uh, institution building, about strengthening capacity, uh, and about the uh, uh, economic agenda. Um, by saying that it's not to say that uh, it is not a sensitive issue, uh, ASEAN issue, uh, it is a sensitive geopolitical, uh, in the geopolitical context. Um, and the difference with Cambodia was that uh, Cambodia was, um, you know, the resolution of it took place uh, at the end of uh, a Cold War. It was a helpful uh, geopolitical context. Uh, this is taking place um, at the period of uh, of something that we don't have a name yet for it. Uh, maybe this evening we'll come up with a name for this period. We cannot call it the post-post-Cold War period. Um, so um, there are obviously various interests uh, uh, in this. And for Indonesia, it will go beyond the chairmanship uh, year. The, the interest and the effort on the environment. Uh, I think also for, for Australia. Um, so how do we um, support the Myanmaris in finding a resolution for it? It has to be something that is inclusive in nature. This question, Danny. My name is Sanal. Thank you for very incisive uh, discussions and your expressions. Uh, I must compliment you that uh, ASEAN has come a long way, as I have seen it while working in Jakarta myself. But uh, I would like to ask your opinion, personal opinion or views. In the hybrid combination of geopolitics and economic community, what would be the priority of Indonesia? Especially when the economic community has not seen as much uh, progress as it was expected, not only say three years, but almost 10 years ago. So I would like to pick up the thread from your uh, reviews. Thank you, sir. Well, um, I think I'll give you uh, two responses to that. The first is um, the ASEAN's interest in uh, ensuring its, its role as an epicenter of growth. A market of uh, more than 650 million people, uh, quite a healthy growth and with uh, stakeholders uh, among the major countries. It's a question of, this is mixing geopolitics and economics. So ensuring uh, how the stability is maintained by ensuring that the major countries uh, continue to see their interest is engaging and becoming stakeholders to this. So that is uh, one challenge. And the purpose of meetings like the one last week and then the summits in September uh, would uh, fulfill that part. But it's also a challenge for ASEAN to make sure that it continues to remain um, a useful option for other countries to remain engaged. So it's also incumbent upon, upon ASEAN. Secondly, the, uh, the pandemic and the uh, situation in Europe and uh, what appears to be a fracturing of the uh, global uh, uh, trading system. Um, the uh, reliance on neighboring countries, especially for uh, items such as food, uh, then should be greater. We should be relying more uh, on the immediate neighborhood. So out of this, uh, you know, there is some work being done in ASEAN for uh, ensuring uh, uh, food security, especially in times of crisis. 
So making sure that uh, in times of crisis, that uh, food is made available for the region. Um, and also we are, uh, in ASEAN, uh, we are working with a number of countries such as Australia uh, on this basis. Yes, from the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Salfin. I'm also from uh, this Crawford School. I would like to ask uh, something about the relations between uh, the Asian Centrality and the Asian Way. Uh, is uh, about the role of ASEAN that uh, Sidar has been underlined in resolving the crisis, the regional crisis such as <coughs> Myanmar and etc. So how will Indonesia manage to uh, implement the ASEAN centrality to not crossing the Asian way? Because uh, the Asian way has a principle of non-interference. How Indonesia will manage not to interfere in the uh, intervening in the internal uh, government, in the internal government of issues like the young world. So, thank you. I think the ASEAN way is reflected uh, in the inter interaction um, and also reflected in the discussions behind closed doors. Um, so uh, there are those values um, that is not very easy to describe or define, uh, but exists. And it percolates into the language, such as in the joint communique. Uh, Certain sensitive issues are uh, glossed over um, and uh, or even though discussed in a frank and open manner. Now, when we talk about non-interference, um, I guess an easy illustration is, uh, um, you know, um, non-interference within a family. Yeah, you don't mix in with each other's business, but. You, know, you you have that uh, you you have that discussion, and there are certain uh, norms and rules that are expected of you. Uh, so in the in the charter, uh, ASEAN charter, it talks about um, uh, good governance. It talks about democratic governance, um, apart from non-interference. There there are certain uh, you know understanding that we want to build a, a common norms. Because if you want to develop community, there, there has to be common norms, common standard of behavior. Um, and this is something to be aspired to. It's not necessarily uh, with us, but something that we, we work uh, for. Then here, John. Yeah. Okay, I'll just talk. Sorry. <laughs> John McCarthy, uh, former foreign affairs and trade. Um, look, a couple of questions, Buck. And it's about essentially the two elements in the room, uh, China and the United States. What do you see ASEAN as being able to do to lower the level of tension between those two countries? What sort of steps might ASEAN have in mind to do that? And the second question is this. Uh, Indonesia is a very big country in its own right. And it doesn't always have to walk in lockstep with ASEAN on every policy issue. What might Indonesia be able to do uh, bringing ASEAN along with it, but very much uh, on its own initiative to seek to lower tension between China and the United States? We should talk about the three in, in the room. So the, the eagle, the panda, and the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, India-China relations is also uh, uh, critical. Um, I, I think that um, the Quad was made possible by an India that was insecure. 
Um, and that's also how the uh, Malabar Naval Exercise became for. Uh, so I think it's, it's also uh, um, critical. And for the, for the region, this is, these are the ones that will remain. Um, China, US uh, is critical. Um, but the US has always been unpredictable. And uh, I think it occasionally sometimes chooses to be so. Um, but uh, you are right, it is critical. Um, and for ASEAN, it is um, a matter within ASEAN, uh, there is that need to start to think about uh, not only the code of conduct uh, on the South China Sea with China, uh, important uh, in its own right. Uh, and there are processes ongoing. We, I think, uh, for Indonesia, we are quite confident that we can accelerate the process. Um, but what's uh, more urgent and critical is a form of code, a form of conduct between China and the U.S. That's the uh, the more critical and urgent uh, part um, of of this uh, maritime domain. Uh, so that's. Um, what I think uh, ASEAN should start uh, uh, moving towards. Uh, I mean, uh, through uh, diplomatic channels, uh, these are things that, that are being voiced um, and, and supported. So, um, something that uh, you know, we, we, we need to start um, really think about. And then uh, for ASEAN itself, <coughs> Um, how to develop its own uh, rules and norms for the region. Uh, so apart from more general uh, norms like the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, uh, what kind of rules that will be uh, uh, more, uh, more relevant or uh, more reflective of its uh, geopolitically maritime nature? So this is uh, uh, well, what I think uh, uh, can be done. This is clarified code of conduct between China and the United States, not mm -hmm. China and ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So there is a China and ASEAN code of conduct, uh, but um, what is urgent is also uh, some kind of uh, code between uh, China and, and the US. That is the more urgent one. Next question here. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Lorraine Elliott. I'm a Professor of International Relations here in this building. Um, I'd like to go back to sort of the agenda that you were talking about in terms of um, the challenges for ASEAN and particularly to look at the um, we like issue centrality around climate change, but I'm thinking more specifically about um, decarbonisation pathways. Uh, Indonesia itself has actually taken a lead on this in 2019 the government published a very, very detailed report um, setting out uh, a decarbonisation plan, transition to a low carbon economy for Indonesia, subtitled in fact a paradigm shift, which I thought was a really interesting uh, terminology, at least in the English language version. Um, the, at the level of the ASEAN member states, they've all, they're all members of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, they've all signed up to the Paris Agreement, and they've all submitted their first nationally determined contributions. But there's a great deal of variety in those um, documents and in those plans. At the level of ASEAN, there's um, <coughs> ASEAN now has a state of climate report. There's an ASEAN Centre for Energy. Um, I think there's supposed to be the establishment in Brunei Darussalam of a Centre for Climate Change. So we have kind of a, a regional level activity, which is is not. Uh, which is really very much about sort of setting, I guess, the norms and rules that we talked about. We have a great deal of variety at the level of the member states. These are really crucial issues for ASEAN. Energy market demand is going to continue to grow, but at the same time, it's a region that is highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So in terms of balancing around, around the centrality and the ambiguity of centrality, how do you move forward on this? How do you have this sort of regional level of activity? You have a variety of, of processes and plans in place at a national level. 
how do you, how do you make those coherent? How do you do that to, to move these issues forward in a way that actually gets to some real outcomes? Well, um, a few things come to mind. The, the first is this um, a vision of an ASEAN grid. But at the same time, also realization that, uh, again, this is a fractured region. So um, in the Mekong region, that uh, the establishment of a grid, um, and then also in, in Kalimantan, in Borneo, um, but then also models for, for grid. This is uh, at the, at the, there's a discussion ongoing uh, on that. And then on, uh, on carbon, uh, I think we are there are thinkings uh, going about the creation of a carbon market. But for Indonesia, um, the focus now is a national uh, carbon market. Uh, so uh, how to establish that. And then uh, thirdly, a lot of effort currently is uh, actually going into the, uh, the blue economy. So um, you know, um, this debate, why not green, why blue? Um, there is a thinking that uh, this is also uh, uh, it serves as a, a new economic uh, source of growth. It's an area that is uh, less explored. So um, rather than talk about uh, uh, fish or um, other resources, we talk about we start talking about um, uh, added value to these uh, resources. Uh, so from seaweed into um, bio, biochemistry and others. Uh, so this year, uh, we are hoping to adopt uh, an ASEAN uh, framework from the economy, building on uh, Brunei's uh, leader's decision in 2021. And uh, so, yeah. Question down front here. Suppose that's. Hello, I'm Yona, uh, an exchange student in AMU from Indonesia Zoo. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, formation of August that you mentioned earlier. Uh, in 2021, this uh, security pact announced that their working region was in the Asia Pacific, which includes the territory of Asian Zoo but many believes that um, the formation of this uh, security pact is a, uh, is a threat for Asian neutrality. And until now, we haven't really heard any official statement from the ASEAN. Like some of uh, the countries uh, are in favor of this, but some of um, them are, including Indonesia, be against the, the AUKUS. So what do, what do we really, really think about the AUKUS? Will it ever be a threat or will we ever be in favor? We uh, reverse to Indonesia and ASEAN. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, it's not the first time that ASEAN operates in the same geographical space as uh, other regional organizations. Uh, in the past, it would have been uh, the American Alliance system. Um, now there's AUKUS. So it's, it's a uh, it, it shouldn't be uh, a problem on its own. I think a more critical question would be uh, what kind of rules and norms that we have to build for, for the maritime space that is, for the most part, uh, Southeast Asian um, and also uh, a crossroad for many interests. Uh, we don't have that at the moment. So it's something that uh, we, we need to build on. Uh, we have uh, instruments like uh, the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, uh, but there are also other instruments. So uh, the region uh, may want to look into it and then uh, build it up. So how could the region decide on its own uh, rules and norms and not have uh, uh, other countries decide for, decide for the rules and norms for the region? So when I was in, uh, India, uh, you know, many people would ask me, uh, you know, countries are projecting their navy into Southeast Asia. 
So what is Indonesia going to do? Well, said, we are not projecting anywhere since uh, these navies are projected into our waters. We have to ensure that uh, you know, our waters remain stable and open for all, and all would respect the rights of others for equal access. Not only for their own access, but also respect the right of others into uh, access to and access to the region. We've got James and we'll have Gary after that, and if we have any more time, we'll, we'll go to the back. Please, James. James Tarn from the Australian Financial Review and the History Department at Sydney University. Thanks for your remarks. I just want to draw you out a bit more, if I may, on your comment just now about US unpredictability. And uh, <clears throat> last year, the former Singaporean ambassador to the United States, Chan Heng Chi, gave a very interesting speech about why she thought America needed an Ezra Vogel for Southeast Asia. The American tendency to still look at the region as a, as a block rather than a sort of uh, have an appreciation for the different countries and cultures and sensitivities therein. I wonder what your reaction to that kind of assessment is. And secondly, would you be prepared to give uh, a response to the Biden administration's policy towards Southeast Asia uh, in this term, uh, with particular reference to America's economic footprint in the region through IPEF. Thanks. From the perspective of ASEAN, it has always looked to um, engaging the, the US uh, from uh, well, throughout the years. Uh, from the US side, there has been um, uh, greater attention. Um, uh, I think there is a, a throughout the years and at various administration, uh, there is a, a growing trend of interest in Southeast Asia, not only uh, as a function of China, but, but uh, on its own right as well. Um, and I think the uh, Obama administration, uh, there was a market, uh, markedly uh, stronger uh, interest in it. Um, and this continues uh, with the Biden administration and uh, uh, many of the uh, 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 policy makers um, you know, are, uh, it's, it's a continuation of it. Indonesia happens to be the country coordinator for ASEAN in ASEAN-US relations. So that's, uh, uh, last year there was a ASEAN-US uh, special summit and uh, this year we are working on establishing an uh, ASEAN-US center uh, in the US. It's uh, still at the initial stage of, of uh, planning and conceptualizing, uh, but I think we can be uh, quite optimistic. Uh, it can be realized, um, and I'm, I'm quite optimistic that this is something that that can be uh, uh, sustained. Uh, uh, but of course, Washington will always have a global view. Um, but at the same time, the interest in Southeast Asia will also continue to grow. Uh, Gary, and then Fred, that's going to have to be the last question. Well, thank you very much, Kevin McCassie, for your presentation and welcome to Canberra. Um, Gary, I, I used to be in DFAT as well, and I was at one stage senior official to us here, and that's in Indonesia and so on. Look, a question, you mentioned the Mekong grid, and it reminds me about the Mekong region. And what I'd like is uh, a sense from you of where things now stand, because uh, some people have said over the last few years that China is seeking to wedge the five preparing states, you know, the three Indo Chinese, plus Myanmar and Thailand, in some way to wedge mainland Southeast Asia, ASEAN members, and Maritime. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering what your sense of this is, because a number of commentators, as I say, have been quite worried about this over the last few years. Yeah. Well, the Mekong is, uh, is in uh, China's immediate neighborhood. Uh, and as China grows, 
the uh, relationship uh, with with the Mekong will inevitably uh, also grow, and there would be it would have uh, its own dynamics between uh, the Mekong sub region and uh, China, but also India, which which are in the uh, in that region. Um, so there's this uh, this dynamic. There are processes in terms of uh, water management, um, and we are supportive. Indonesia is supportive of that process. Indonesia itself is um, starting to undertake its own uh, uh, or enhancing its relationship with the Mekong sub-region, uh, building on the existing bilateral relations. Um, so. You know, some uh, some small steps for Indonesia in that direction. Um, I think uh, from within the Mekong itself, they also have their own uh, discussions. There are countries that would like to uh, strengthen relationship uh, uh, between uh, Mekong and other partners. Um, the situation in Myanmar, though, has created certain complexities. Um, for countries, uh, certain countries uh, that that would not recognize the uh, the Myanmar uh, uh, junta, so that creates that complexity at the political level. Um, so that that's another layer of uh, complexity. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you so much, Pagato, for being so generous with uh, your views and. and I've uh, taken so many questions, you can see we could probably go all night. Um, to tell us about the different dimensions of centrality, ASEAN centrality, that matter so much, matter to us here in Australia and the wider region, and the convening power, of course, of ASEAN. Um, but, you know, I think we take for granted uh, sometimes, and we don't appreciate it enough, but uh, extremely important, and <laughs> extremely important that Indonesia is, is chair of ASEAN at this particular time, because more of the same is, is not enough right now with the external environment, with the eagles and the elephants and, um, and dragons, um, and more. Uh, so we've got high expectations for this year and what you produce. It may seem a bit unfair, but you've got a pretty good track record. Um, uh, and again, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to share your views and to fill so many questions. So please join me in thanking Pak Gift. Thank you, everybody, for uh, bearing with me. <laughs> Some paying you good stuff. It's a book to read. Some homework, yes. Homework. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.